ladies and gentlemen good day and welcome to the earnings call of iris business services limited for the quarter and year ended 31st march 2024 as a reminder all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes should you need assistance during the conference call please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone please note that this conference is being recorded we have mr s swaminathan ceo mr k balachandran cfo ms deepta rangarajan whole time director mr p k x thomas cto of the company i now hand the conference over to mr s swaminathan thank you and over to you sir thank you uh, just a word of caution before we start i'm actually at an airport and if occasionally i'll go on foot because announcements are being made in the airport uh i think it's been an extraordinarily good year thanks to the chadasikin contract that we won last year and uh, from where we were about 6 7 years ago to come to this stage this stage where we have this cost of 100 crore revenue i think it's a big deal and uh, i'm grateful to all of our colleagues for making this happen and uh, given given the and the, as i just said i think the nature of performance will keep changing from time to time this whole uh, year has actually been driven by uh, the first business which is a collect business of the company as you know the business has three parts collect create and consume collect help the regulators create the enterprises and consume the data and this part the collect business is the one that actually drove performance this year uh do increasing we have our focus is on create uh, we are also trying to take the create business away from mandate led opportunities to other areas uh, which we will see going forward but i think the, the momentum that we have the tailwind that we have and the cash that we have in the bank uh, going forward we will see we have to take over cash in the bank all this gives us the confidence that uh, we should be able to mount a reasonable attempt at capturing more market share how we translate translate into revenues going forward is something that only time will tell uh, but i think before i get on to anything of the chart i'll let balu take you through i think the presentation is already uploaded i'll let balu take you through the broad numbers before we get to the things so much balu i think we also have sarbo on the call who is a recent uh, sales hire he comes with a significant amount of experience on the saas sales front so he's also available if you want to pose any questions to him uh, we also have we have anu who has been working on taking carbon beyond the mandate uh, so as and we also have several other colleagues joining the call who we can always turn to for questions if you have specific questions on specific areas but we'll start with balu balu over to you <coughs> thank you very much samidhan i hope all of you can hear me uh, good evening and it's great to see a nice turnout for this conference call it's also good to meet with all of you after a gap of 6 uh, odd months So as usual, I'll quickly run through some of the highlights of our financial performance for the year ended March 2024. I hope some of you have seen our initial presentation, which we uploaded on the Exchange website a few hours ago. Uh, coming to financial performance for the last quarter, you will see that we have pretty much carried the momentum that we have shown in the previous nine months, previous quarters. Just that we have done a wee bit better this quarter. The top line growth uh, is a tad more compared to the previous quarters. While at the PPT level, we have uh, done uh, a bit better as well. However, uh, we continue to maintain that it is best to look at uh, our company's growth trajectory from a 12-month perspective. For the full year, uh, we have grown at about 37%. while the bitta increased by 45% at the same time the profit before tax nearly doubled take me to look at the expenses uh, you would see that costs have nearly kept pace little less uh, with the top line given our need to spend on growing the business especially on the creative side so that continues and as expected and as swaminathan mentioned this year's performance has been boosted by a stellar uh, turn out from the collect segment which grew as much as 70%. On the other hand the create segment growth was more sedate though in terms of number of customer additions I would say it is uh, quite decent as well. Now let me just uh, you know go through a couple of uh, interesting financial indicators. 
I'm happy to report our, that our return on net worth, the key ROE, has moved up uh, uh, substantially to 21% from the previous year's 14%. But if I look at the number from a return on average net worth, we do it at the end of the uh, March uh, you know, balance sheet figure. But if I look at it from an average point of view, this will be even better. So that is something which is uh, quite gratifying, especially, especially to me, given the fact that we need to use our capital uh, you know, in a very wise manner. The other thing I would like to highlight is uh, that we have done uh, uh, quite reasonably well on our collection process. Collection efficiencies have improved, with the result that receivables as days of sales uh, have reduced to about 80, uh, 80 days, uh, which has also helped our working capital management uh, as well. And before I wind up, uh, I also want to mention that you know, our net operating cash flow for the full year is now close to 12 crores and more than uh, doubled from the previous year's numbers, uh, which is again quite gratifying. Uh, having said that, that is still you know, a modest number. Uh, we need to make sure that you know, we do much better going forward. Uh, the balance sheet cash position uh, also has improved, which Swami also mentioned giving us that extra room in spending uh, so that we can scale our cash business in a much more you know, uh, meaningful manner. So that is uh, all from our, my side at this point of time, and we can perhaps open the uh, you know, uh, session for uh, Q&A. Swami, over to you. I think before we get to Q&A, Deepa, you have any opening remarks to make? No, 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 no. Detail and audible. Okay. Much better, but not significantly so. I think you need to speak into the mic. What the mic you have? Okay. Okay. No, no specific remarks for me. I'll uh, I'll take anything for Q and A. That other comes. Okay. Thomas, do you have any comments to make? No, Mr. Thomas. Actually, there is nothing from my side. If there is any questions, I'll definitely have to take it. Okay. So, with the moderator, for any questions that may want to come up. Thank you so much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1 on their touchstone phone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and 2. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Again, if you have a question, please press star and 1. The first question is from the line of Mitesh Mehta from Investor. Please go ahead. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Please go. Yeah, you are. Yeah. Uh, congratulations, first of all, for great set of numbers. Uh, my first question is uh, related to uh, marketing plan for uh, collect business. Like, how do we plan to expand the business uh, and geography, geographical reach for this uh, for business? Because I feel that is uh, that holds a very good potential. So every segment that we have has significant potential. The nature of marketing in the collect business is very different from the nature of marketing in the CH or the other businesses. The collect business is largely driven by RFPs where regulators issue RFPs on which we bid, and then we thereafter win some, we lose some. Uh, so the the way we approach this we approach this segment is by getting in front of as many regulators as possible and telling them that we are potentially good partners for them to work with if they are looking to implement a regulatory filing platform. And that's what we do. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. Now you want to add this? Okay. Second question. My second question is regarding is there any uh, further plan in company to bifurcate the business or uh, split the business into two, especially to ge generate more <coughs> capital for further expansion? You know, there are always discussions that happen within the company about subdividing the company into various parts, uh, including collectively and consume. These are discussions that happen at the board at a single level. And if and, if and when 
anything comes to fruition our schedule will be the first one okay okay thank you we yeah. always have we always have academic academic discussions keep happening all the time you know okay. our board is very active board and we keep are uh, being getting we keep getting asked questions about these plans uh, so as i said i mean one sunday the board basically says yes we need to do it. i think we'll go ahead and do it okay okay that's it from my side if i have any questions i'll get into it thank you yeah. thank you thank you thank you the next question is from the line of rohit potty from who's an individual investor please go ahead uh thank you for this opportunity and first congratulations to the entire team uh, i mean 100 crore is a great milestone and uh, uh, it was definitely hard one so uh, very happy for all of you guys and congratulations uh, my first question is on collect uh, uh, south africa mandate drove majority of the growth this year so uh, what proportion of the contract is done and how much more of the order book is left there is one question and uh, the pipeline in collect i mean what after south africa is is the other question Well, you want to take that? Yeah, I can do that. Uh, while we don't want to give out precise numbers, uh, I would broadly say that uh, the South African contract, uh, you know, uh, you could say perhaps you know uh, 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 about 30-35 uh, percent uh, is already uh, you know um, uh, done at this point of time. The current contract shape, of course, we can expand it as we go along. So that's one number that you can uh, keep in mind. and outside that to say that you know uh, what i have seen in the or what we have seen in the last uh, few months uh, the collect pipeline is looking more and more interesting there are more and more you know um, uh, inquiries getting floated um, uh, in, in the in, in the market we are responding as well it takes time for you know the whole process to you know come to fruition and about gets you know uh, announced but i would say that you know um, the, you know um, uh, the uh pipeline is certainly looking interesting and uh, we don't see much of a problem uh, in terms of you know uh, in terms of uh, you know not having you know uh, not ha- not not being able to substitute what are we accrue on the execution of the south african project that's what i would say, i would see at this point of time so basically what basically basically what balu is saying is that i'll continue to get salaries going forward <laughs> uh, yeah so uh, i'm just curious now is any tenders uh, not just up for bid but any tender results have to be out this year where we can announce any we deal wins like we did in the past with bhutan and others yeah i yeah, would be hoping that you know, we would be able to make uh, a few announcements uh, over the course of the next few months having said that we can only do that if you know certain paperwork etc gets complete uh, and we are confident that you know this is something where we can meet the requirements conditions which you know uh, which are required before announcement having said that you know uh, i wouldn't be surprised that you know <laughs> if you if before we meet again there would be some announcements oh thank you i mean yeah that that's what i was looking for i mean so some tender is also going to be coming on so that's good to hear uh, even if we know not so uh, the other question is on uh, create uh, i mean it was very hard thing to see i mean uh, despite no new mandates coming out locally we still had a 20 odd percent growth which indicates that we are winning market share with uh, the sales and marketing team that we have right now so in that context it will be great to hear more from the management uh, i mean you have had a new hire also uh, uh, in in a chief sales officer which is that thing as well uh, we added a product officer and now a sales officer so it's great to see so it will be great to hear uh, more on your strategy for winning uh, 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 converting more customers to carbon going forward because on one hand we understand the product is sticky so the conversion is difficult so, um, so so how do we intend to do that with the absence of new mandates going forward so there was one very interesting development this year which actually surprised all of us uh, one of our former partners came back to us because they discovered that their current product does not meet the requirements in europe like ours does i think uh, deepa or anu can tell you more about it deepa anu one of you can actually take it forward this is because you know more about it than i do Yes, sure. Hi, this is uh, Anuradha. So we, uh, we've been working closely with partners in Europe. In fact, uh, one of the early partners that we had signed up, of course, initially they weren't giving us good business. So I think over the course of uh, years, I think they are trying to go global. They are looking for uh, a partner who is able to uh, overall 
cover and uh, cater to global customer base, which is the carbon perfectly fits in. It has been positioned as one platform for multiple geo-reporting, multiple regulatory reporting, and of course, uh, you know, now of course we have mandates which is upcoming as well. So it is very, very interesting to see how uh, partners from the past are also reconnecting back to that so with possible newer opportunities. So, however, it's at a very early stage, it's a very early stage conversation. We need to see how this stands out. Thank you. Anu, Aditya, you want to take it forward? I'm about to go through and Aditya, can you talk about it, please? Uh, one more time, Swan. Absolutely. Can you talk about fluence? Can you talk about fluence? Um, I know I am not able to hear Swan. Can Can you talk about what? Fluence. The recent conversation with fluence, ah, where sorry. they found that our product was actually that's not a question. That's not a question. I passed on to Anu. She answered a different question altogether. Correct, correct, correct. Uh, uh, so, Anu, you wanted to talk about influence, where they actually came back to us uh, after evaluating other products and said that our product was far better, the product market fit. I think Swami wanted to, uh, to speak about that. Yes. Dita, you take it. Dita, you take it. Okay. Sure. Uh, if you can hear me, okay. So, uh, 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 so yeah, this is a, a specifically in the European market. Uh, we had a partner uh, four five years ago who uh, actually was retailing both our product as well as um, uh, some other third party product as well uh, in the marketplace. This year, this uh, partner came back to us and said that they wanted to work with us uh, far more seriously. They actually felt that the other products in the market were. Uh, not as good as falling behind, and they felt that Iris was doing, uh, the Iris carbon product, I'm so sorry, was doing, um, was much better, especially given the changing uh, complexity of the mandate, you know, where, uh, you know, where uh, things like text blocks need to be tagged, et cetera, et cetera, and they said that carbon clearly seems to be um, a much better product, and we'd like to take this as the main product out, um, so, you know, we'd like to position this to our leadership as the main product that we'd like to take out into market. So I think that, um, that was so basically, Rohit, the point I'm trying to make here is the following. Since we operate in multiple geographies, we have had to work with different kinds of mandates. So carbon has had to deal with multiple multitude of situations. So if you throw a new situation at us, we probably have seen it before in another country. Therefore, our preparedness for any change in the mandate, by virtue of being in so many countries, is actually much better than people in single markets within just one uniform market. So EU is one uniform market. So if you basically are selling carbon just in EU, well, that's all that you have. But if you're selling a carbon in EU, in India, in South Africa, and several other markets around the world, you've been thrown different problems from different markets, and therefore you're able to prepare for a new mandate change or a complexity in the mandate much more easily than in India. So this conversation that we had with our partner, was a huge vindication of our strategy of going to multiple markets. That's what I want to mention to you. Well, so it's very interesting to hear. So the revenue from Fluence has started coming, or is it uh, not yet? No, 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 no. It's still early. It's still early. And if uh, there is a boy likes girl, it still doesn't mean they're getting married. <laughs> okay, understood. So, uh, uh, could we understand? I mean, so uh, I believe that uh, you mentioned we hired a new sales officer uh, who has. Uh, uh, focus on the past space in the past. So it, it would be great if you can hear uh, from him on the strategy uh, for SAS going forward because I understand the competition sells sort of a, solu I mean a basket solution and not just one particular piece. So to get the customer to shift from one to another or one company to another, preferably to Iris, is, 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 is a more difficult task uh, is what I understood. So how do we, Correct. in absence of a mandate, how do we uh, win uh, more clients and how do we grow create uh, is something that would be great because I believe from the past you mentioned that pricing is not something we uh, grow on uh, but we'll rather grow on volumes. So that'll be so before I so before I get Servo in maybe Dita can you introduce Servo so that Servo can then take the question please. Uh, sure. Uh, so just to uh, what did you and hand, hand it over to him so we can talk a little bit more. Uh, if you remember on the last on the last call, uh, you know, we talked about two things. One was 
uh, establishing product market fit, and the second was strengthening the sales and marketing infrastructure. Uh, so, product market fit point of view, carbon uh, uh, distribution management perspective, we have a lot and version by point two, we have got feedback. Uh, incorporated it and, uh, you know, you need to point it. So it's interesting that we have done with every other opportunity. It's the same thing that we're doing on the disclosure management side. So uh, on the product side, we're kind of like happy to say that each passing release and each passing uh, user feedback, you know, we have established further and further uh, um, fit, 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 fitness of product, if I can put it like that. So today, it's not any introduced servo in terms of Dita, can you introduce Servo in terms of his background? I mean, that's the whole bit. Oh, certainly, certainly. Uh, so, yeah. On the sales and marketing side, we've actually hired in uh, from a sales leadership point of view, uh, Servo. He's on the call with us today. Um, he's a heading uh, sales, uh, sales and marketing, basically growth for Iris Carbon. And he comes in from a background of uh, uh, SaaS sales. Uh, he was earlier with a company called High Radius, uh, and I think he'll be able to talk to it much more. Where he has been a part of the ramp up and uh, scale up journey. If I, if, I, if I have it correctly, uh, High Radius is now at about a $250 million ARR, but he's been through much of the uh, uh, scale up journey of High Radius. And so he has uh, been with us now close to three months. I now started setting the entire sales and marketing uh, uh, um, pieces in order for us to be able to take carbon uh, out at scale in the market. And uh, I think that was on the call, so, uh, so will you may be able to, uh, you may be able to kind of, uh, it would be, if you can introduce yourself, please. Yep, yeah, yeah. thank you so much, Deepta, and uh, hi, Rohit, and hi, everyone. Um, so as Deepta mentioned, I'm coming from a background of uh, SaaS sales, or selling to the office of the CFO, and uh, helped through the growth journey from a 10 to a $250 million uh, sale, right? So uh, idea is to replicate something similar uh, here at Iris Carbon, selling to the office of the CFO. In terms of answering your questions, Rohit, very specifically, I think um, our objective is to move towards a non-mandate sales, especially with the disclosure management. So we are not going to be focused necessarily on mandate business. Yes, we will continue to do what we are doing, but the idea is to uh, position ourselves where we show value for the disclosure management product and Iris Carbon as a whole. Um, that's number one. The second is, I would say there's an awareness that needs to be created. So Iris Carbon has a great product, but in the North America geography, and to some extent in Europe, there is more awareness that needs to be created. So we're focusing on creating that awareness at the same time, uh, directly as well as via our partners, uh, so that we're able to generate more interest and visibility within the market. So good product plus awareness hopefully should lead to uh, an increase in sales. And I'll pause on that. Does that answer your question, Rohit? No, yeah, that was very helpful. Uh, uh, thank you for answering that so nicely. But uh, a little more detail would help in, in the context. And my understanding is uh, the product, at least the Iris Carbon sells at, let's say, $5,000 to $10,000 uh, per year. Uh, mm -hmm. And and in that context, uh, my understanding is that, so at least because we're selling to the office of the CFO, right? Uh, mm -hmm. They just want to get the work done and... Uh, a saving of let's say thousand two thousand dollars won't cut it because they, I mean, to relearn the whole thing for the whole office, it becomes a little painful for a thousand two thousand dollar in an entire year uh, saving. So in that context, Correct. how do we go about converting? I mean, if it was a tech adoption or a sale, uh, something like that, it might have been dif different. Or if the uh, saving was uh, an order of magnitude higher, then it would have been different. But in this context, uh, is it not difficult to convert? people from the office of the CFO who might not necessarily be very tech savvy to switch from one product to the other. In that context, how do we grow is, is where I'm coming from. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, Rohit. So I think the way we have traditionally sold, um, I think we have pivoted a little bit off late where we are trying to understand the overall value, like you rightly called out. What we have observed is the value is a lot higher that we are delivering or saving to our potential clients. And as we quantify the value to them, they're able to position it better internally. To add to that, I would also say that price or cost is one of the factors that customers or prospects are looking for change. 
what we are trying to identify is the other factors which is causing that pain. So what we, are, when, as in when we understand the reason, so in some cases, I'll give you a small example. One of our competitors, a big one, is not using Microsoft Word, Excel, etc. as their baseline product to work off the disclosure management solution. We are positioning ourselves as you can continue to work using your traditional tools like Microsoft Word and Excel and not having to move out of them. That gives them a lot more comfort. So there are different things that we are doing in short, understanding their pain points, and then positioning ourselves accordingly to the situation may or may not lead to, um, you know, the dollar delta. Some of them are not looking at, like you said, the dollar value savings, but some of them, a lot of them are looking at an ROI or a cost savings, and we are trying to quantify that as much as possible, um, which can add up to a significant number. Does that help? Uh, thank you. Yeah, that that was that that is definitely helpful. I mean, you're talking about ease of using convenience, which which so there is time value as well, which 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 will be very helpful for sure. And uh, so, just one last question. So, in terms of if the strategy is working out or not, the best indicator for us to track, let's say, over the next two three years, would be the uh, create ARR number. Would that be right in thinking to see if the strategy is working going forward? Absolutely. And I would call that a lagging indicator or output metric that you would like to measure. A leading indicator probably would be a uh, growth in uh, pipeline as you move along. So we measure both the leading or input metrics as well as the lagging, and uh, we'll get to know whether strategies are working or not, and we'll make changes as and when needed. Understood. No, fair enough. I, I don't think we'll be privy to the leading indicator for uh, confidentiality purpose, perhaps. So I'll I'll I'll, I'll look forward to uh, seeing the uh, lagging indicator move up quite uh, healthily going forward. Uh, thank Absolutely. you so, so much for your answers, uh, the management. And once again, congratulations to everybody for the 100 crore achievement. Uh, really happy to see you guys. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Deepak Butter, who is an individual investor. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Audible, right? Uh, so you're Audible, but you're sounding muffled. So if you're using the speaker mode, maybe request to use the handset mode, please. Sure. Okay. Uh, firstly, congratulations you know, on a fantastic set of numbers. Uh, I think everyone uh, you know did highlight that, right? Uh, I had uh, you know a couple of questions, right? Uh, one is uh, you know on the product ID, right? Uh, which uh, does the automated uh, you know red reporting, right? Uh, I just wanted to understand the sort of you know revenue model here. Like, do we you know like uh, invoice our clients implementation plus you know pay per usage type of model? Uh, you know, and why I'm asking this is you know like. We all know the you know reporting requirements for banks, financial institutions uh, are growing, you know, and will continue to grow exponentially. Uh, so we're just trying to you know link if uh, you know uh, there's a sort of linear uh, you know relationship here. Balu, I got kicked out of the call for a few minutes. I don't know why. So uh, I since I didn't hear the full question, I'll let you take it. I can take the question. Uh, uh, thank you for asking this. Uh, ideally, is a very important and interesting product in the IRIS portfolio. Uh, so we do work with more than one, uh, you know, uh, one model for uh, invoicing. Uh, one, of course, when we started out uh, with Ideal, which is primarily uh, aimed at the BFSA sector, and which typically handles large volumes of data and push the data after doing a set of validations automatically into the regulators, uh, uh, regulators collection platform. So we initially started out with a licensing and AMC model. And that continues. Aapur, call kare Australia Airtel number na. Hello. Yeah, can, I hope yeah. you can hear me. So I was saying that we initially started with the licensing and AMC model, which also is in more at this point of time and it continues with many of our customers. But we have also uh, have an offer, a subscription model, where people pay as a subscription on an annual basis. And we have, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, so I would say maybe, you know, um, uh, 30, 40% percent of clients are using the subscription model. So both are in both. And we do have it on-prem at this point of time, especially in India and Mauritius where we are in operations. In South Africa, we are also started to offer this product on the cloud as well. So this is a product where we feel there's a lot of uh, potential. Of course, the market is uh, very competitive uh, in Europe, uh, especially where XBRL mandates came in quite some time back. But in other countries, uh, it is just opening up. That's what I would say. 
Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I had a follow-up question, uh, you know, on the consumer business side. Right? Uh, now, with all this, uh, you know, data that is getting reported to the regulators, uh, you know, uh, and the sort of standardization sort of coming in, right, uh, uh, again, the expectation would be that, you know, regulators start looking at, you know, all these data for analytics and, you know, even for their policy implementations, right, now or maybe even in the future. Uh, you know, given, uh, you know, uh, regulators are a sort of, you know, very niche uh, client category that, uh, you know, we have, uh, uh, are we seeing that sort of, a, you know, uh, discussions, uh, you know, where they are looking at, you know, uh, help on, you know, understanding and making sense out of all the data, analytics and all of that, or is it too early uh, for that? See, we already have products in the consumer category. For example, if you see our flagship product for the banking system for RBI, something called Silk, which basically is analyzing the filings made by banks uh, to, to, the, to the RBI. And we help RBI make sense of it and do things. So yes, so with every customer, uh, depending on depending on the scope of the implementation of the collect platform, there's also an analytics platform. So when you see the revenues in the case of uh, in the case of uh, consume, uh, a lot of it comes actually from implementation of solutions like that. So we've done something uh, on those lines in uh, in Dubai. Uh, we've done something on similar lines in Oman. So it's increasingly you're absolutely right, and it's a great question for that. Increasingly, customers are, regulators are looking at how to use the data better and also looking at how to use the data along with other data. So, Balu, you want to mention something about the Dubai opportunity that we kept, the, the Dubai delivery we did? So, we provide uh, more uh, for our uh, customer, which is Abu Dhabi Stock Exchange. Uh, so, Content Mall is a product in which uh, whatever data they collect from companies, essentially financial data can be further repackaged into data APIs and be consumed by the exchange customers. This is one of the, you know, uh, one of the you know, offerings that we have in the consume space. Uh, but outside that, we also do uh, normal analytics. We have done that for central banks as well. So it is uh, you know, many times bundled along with the overall soup tech offering, which includes collection and analytics. Thank you. Thanks. And is the space as competitive as the other businesses? I mean, uh, you know, like I mentioned, given our niche client, uh, you know, segment here, uh, is the segment as competitive or uh, we have an advantage there? I think some some regulators see this as a completely different uh, thing altogether. Some com some regulators see it in combination with the platform that we develop for them. So I think there's no uniform answer. Uh, there is competition, but then there is no competition. So. It's up to us. So we, we try to talk to, uh, talk to our regulator uh, customers and basically say, you know, you can do this, 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 this. Uh, sometimes they bite, sometimes they don't bite. I think more often than not, until now, they're not bitten. But I think increasingly we see a trend where people are saying, data to my I've already collected so much data. What can I do with it? And what other data streams can I have talking to it? So the, I don't think there's a, big, there's a very clear cut answer as to how competitive it is, but our strengths by virtue of what we have, are well known, and therefore we're able to get customers with that. We've not really focused on it to the extent that we should, except the, the focus that we do on this one is at the time of the tender itself, where we try to tell them what all they can do with it. So it's not being done as a separate entity. In the case of, as, as Balu said, the Dubai team, for example, we implemented the platform several years ago. It's only now that they've thought about, started talking about how to leverage the data. So I think to each his own. So, it, it's competitive, but not competitive, but we are, we are in a good spot. We are in a good space. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for the detailed answer. Thank you. The next question is from the Yash Naik from Investor. Please go ahead. Slides on how to grow our business in the consumer segment, considering it is our highest margin segment. So, can we uh, like uh, see in next four to five years? Uh, sorry it, to uh, uh, Mr. Naik, your line was not audible at the start. So, could you please uh, repeat your question? Hello, am I audible now? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Could you share some light on how to grow our consumer segment considering it is our highest margin segment? So can we see the significant growth in the top line also going forward in this segment? Uh, Hello? 
we will we'll take this question? It's about consume uh, sector. Uh, line for uh, Mr. Swaminathan is dropped. I'm connecting him back. Okay. So maybe we can come back to this question. Uh, uh, like. Uh, I've just connected him. Just give me a moment. Uh, yes, sir. Hi, I'm back. So please, can you repeat Hello. your question? Yeah, yeah. So, could you share some light on the uh, like a consume segment? It is a, like a high, highest margin segment. So, going forward, could we see some uh, growth in the top line also in future next four to five year in that segment? I think the consume segment is something that we can invest in now. That see, when you don't have money, you have to choose where you invest. We invest in collect and create. Now that we are slightly better off, we will invest increasingly in the consume segment, and we see some significant possibilities there. How fast will it go? What all will it grow? See, the consume segment has other possibilities. We can always offer collect the data for free in return for customers buying carbon. We can offer data for free for people buying our GST solutions. So, consume segment can also be a marketing tool to acquire customers. Consume segment can also be a revenue generating business for customers for for us. So, how we use it is a function of many different factors. The reason we've not shut down the consume segment all these years because it's been very very valuable. in terms of helping us acquire customers by using the data from the consumer segment as a marketing tool but you are absolutely right if we invest in it we will be able to grow it much bigger and that's certainly one of the objective in the years ahead yeah thank you and uh, mainly the id spray dot is uh, is there any coming from that software or uh, like application or it is just for the marketing tool see period is completely free period is completely free therefore there are no revenue from period dot But having said that, today because we are a GSP, we are able to offer data APIs to customers, data APIs to, to lenders, for example. And there are we have tied up with a few lenders. What am I there on the call? Hello. Yes, yes, Tommy, I'm there. Gautam, Gautam, can you talk about how we are leveraging data APIs? Yeah. So Peridot, the Peridot app uh, is completely free, but it actually gives the visibility to uh, end users about the potential of. data uh, that it carries so we've been using this data uh, data apis and providing to uh, you know intermediary uh, erp platforms as well as some of the lenders to use uh, both consent and non consent uh, based data for uh, for various kyc purposes for uh, credit distributing uh, monitoring uh, purposes yeah yeah helpful thank you And yeah, I have one regarding the ESG mandate. So, uh, are there any like uh, updates on that ESG mandate thing? Hello. If I want to answer that on the ESG mandate. Hello. Am I audible? Yeah, audible. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we we can hear you. Okay, great. It's about the ESG mandate. The ESG mandate. There's a question on ESG mandate, and you know, uh, uh, how is it shaping up? Okay. So, uh, so the first, the first region of geography where it is uh, rolling out to Europe. Various uh, companies. Uh, in a phased manner will uh, start reporting sustainability reports it's going to kick in from next year and uh, it will extend after that uh, they is going a little bit slow but there are still uh, pockets uh, in the US the certain states that are also pushing ahead for example like California pushing ahead of the other states so we expect that the ESG mandates in the US will also start rolling out in the US in a couple of years Uh, but right now, for us, we see Europe as an interesting market uh, where we will start rolling out our solution and making it available for ESG reporting as well. Yeah. Okay. Can I yeah, just to clarify one thing? Currently, there is no revenue coming out from the ESG vendor, right? Am I correct on this? Yes. Uh, You're right. You're right. There is your no question uh, is that revenue coming specifically out of an ESG offering. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I do want to apologize for constantly getting bounced over the call. I don't know why it's happening. I'm a brand new airport <coughs> where, for some reason, the call keeps dropping. So my deepest apologies to everybody who's inconvenienced by my being bounced over the call so often. No problem, sir. So the.
the next question is from the line of Deepak Bodhar from Sapphire Capital. Please go ahead. Oh, yeah, I'm audible, sir. Yes, you are. Uh, okay, um, sir, uh, many congratulations for a good set of numbers. Um, so, first of all, I just wanted to understand uh, what's the uh, uh, our annual... Deepak, can you speak louder? You started, when you said, are you my audible? You were very audible. After that, you become completely inaudible because you're too soft. Uh, uh, you're too soft. Better. Okay. Much better. But please speak into the mic because I lost yes, you yes. completely. Yes. Uh, so, I was just trying to understand in terms of your R&D spend, um, uh, I mean, how what's the annual spend that we need to do uh, and, 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 and the, how much we capitalize and what would be a... Uh, capitalized amount as uh, in our book as of now? So the nature of our business is that R&D is a continuous spend and uh, if you take a look at carbon, uh, there's always constant improvements happening, there are constant product upgrades happening and there's constant R&D happening in terms of what the next release should contain. Uh, Deepa, you want to take the question on how we approach R&D in the context of carbon? Uh, sure. Um, I'm not sure if my voice is clear, and if it is not, I'll just uh, please request either Bali or Anu to take it. But uh, in short, there is continuous product enhancement, uh, both uh, uh, both for newer modules, such as uh, uh, our disclosure management module, the ESG module, etc., as well as for enhancements in functionality. For example, bringing in, bringing in more, uh, um, let, let's say, Gen AI into the product, or bringing in more analytics capabilities into the product. So all of these become a part of continuous R&D investment in both keeping the product current and also taking it ahead of competition. Yeah, so I was just trying to understand what is in rupees crores, what is the spend that we did in last year, FI24? See, then let me come in here, Dita. Uh, uh, so we do have a capitalization, uh, you know, um, uh, stream, uh, which will be less than the uh, money we spend in R&D, and because uh, certain conditions have to be met before we capitalize. So the capitalization would be about, I would say, about you know, um, 2.3 to 2.4 crores for this year. Uh, but we t do spend the money little more than that because some of these, you know, uh, uh, activities are not fitting for capitalization. And how much was the money spent in FI24 in R&D? FI24 R&D, on the whole, I wouldn't I would like to give a number, but I would say capitalization would be about 2.3, 2.4 crores. Okay, and, and what would be total amount sitting in our balance sheet, the capitalized amount? So the intangible assets, which includes, uh, uh, which are capitalization, which are in process, would be about uh, 4 crores. Would be about uh, four crores. Fair enough. I, I I got it. And 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 my uh, second question is on your sustainability. I mean, this uh, this quarter we saw a good jump in quarter and quarter revenue, and uh, and which also led to uh, b b better leverage for our company and uh, and uh, delivered higher EBITDA margin. So how sustainable is this kind of EBITDA margin, and what sort of growth uh, we are looking at for FI25? Uh, See, uh, we don't make any forward-looking statements, but the rest of it I'll let Balu handle. Uh, come again? Uh, you, you are not audible, sir. That's because I'm at the airport. Uh, before, I, before I get to uh, the question that you asked, I want to add one more thing here. You know, there are different people in the company with different skill sets. So for a company like us, don't look at R&D spend as something that happens in isolation. R&D spend for a company like us is largely salaries. R&D spend in many of the companies, they have a separate division, they have a separate R&D lab, that's not really how it works here. So we currently have, for example, a gentleman working on one product who is basically going to figure out how to use LLM for different products. Now, will that uh, lead to something in carbon? Will it lead to something in GST? Will it lead to something elsewhere? Well, we're all holding our breath in terms of what, what could actually happen. So please don't look at R&D as a complete some separate division that we actually have maintained with a bunch of separate people. R&D is a continuous process for every product. So, which is why estimating R&D expenditure separately is a hazardous task. Now, to come back to your question about looking forward for FI25, we don't make any forward-looking statements at all, so I cannot answer that question about FI25. Not can well, not can any of us. Uh, okay, fair enough. But 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 uh, are we uh, are we seeing in a I mean uh, other northward direction on a uh, on a going forward basis? I mean, without giving any kind of um, objective uh, number, subjectively, if you can. Define something that would be helpful. I don't make any going forward statements of any kind under any circumstances. Uh, I can only tell you that we can only look back and basically say what have we done. As a company, we are constantly striving to get the maximum bang for the buck. We are constantly striving to invest in ways that gives us the best possible returns. 
and we are constantly trying to allocate capital depending on where we think the best returns are. Now, what will we do going forward? Well, I think every quarter when we come up with something, we will actually see it. We don't make any forward-looking statements as a matter of policy in this company. Fair enough. Uh, that's fair. And uh, just one last thing, in terms of tax rate, what is the tax rate we are looking at? Uh, we need tax rate? Tax rate. Tax rate, yeah. Yeah, we are 25-26% marginal tax rate, but we do have some uh, mat credit available because we were incurring losses earlier and we were paying the taxes on the book profits mm -hmm. and we have recognized the deferred tax on the mat credits this year. So, um, effective tax rate would be around 10 to 12%. Yes. And, and, and this will continue, uh, this effective tax, or will normalize to 25-26%? Yeah, a little bit. For this year, I expect it to continue. Uh, this, uh, uh, the, the, the reduced tax rate. Yes. Okay, fair enough. All the very best, sir. Uh, that, that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rahul Pansali from Parami Capital. Please go ahead. Yes, hi. Uh, so, our uh, biggest competitor in the U.S., uh, they spend around $150 billion annually on research and development. And still, you know, we have been able to compete quite well. So what has helped us to compete with them in in the last few years? And in general, how do you see the competitive intensity going forward in different regions? I think it's a great question. Uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, something that is not really... Uh, I mean, I think it's a complete, uh, we don't really account for R&D separately to the fullest extent of R&D. It's a continuous improvement process that actually happens, unless, unlike Workiva. And uh, so I think there are differences in accounting, accounting treatment of R&D. That's what we need to know. Secondly, the reason why we are constantly ahead is because we have a motivated team. You know, I don't know which, which car company, I think Avis or Hertz used to say that we try harder. So when you have a motivated team working on multiple countries, and Pulling ideas from multiple countries and bringing it all together onto one platform, you will actually see constant improvement of the product and constant R&D happening. Uh, as I said, you do what's appropriate. So what applies to South Africa is different from what applies to India. What applies to India is very different from what applies to Singapore. So the fact that we are in so many countries automatically changes the way we approach product development, changes the way we do product deployment. And today, for example, every product that we have whether it be carbon, rifle, or ideal, are products that allow us the comfort of going global. Even if we may take a look at GST, our invoice experience that we have from India, while the product may not be directly relevant for Malaysia, we are now taking the product to Malaysia and we're getting some piece of retraction there. So I think R&D is something that's happened in the marketplace. It's not something that happens in the lab. If you're constantly close to your customers, if you have your ear to your customers, then the customers tell you what is required, what the new things are. So, for example, I mean, the example that Gita gave earlier, is it, is it, is, does it require a huge amount of brains to know that the whole world works in, works in Microsoft and knowing that that can be a differentiating factor in, in case of Harman? It doesn't require a genius to do that because the whole world works in Microsoft. But Workiva being a dominant player and a big player said they are not going to work with Microsoft, they are going to work with uh, the existing, they, they have their own flavor of work. That's the way they've done it. But could they tomorrow move to a word-based environment? Absolutely possible. So, but I, I think the fact that we work close to our customers and we're constantly talking to customers gives us the comfort to stay ahead of the curve. And we, I, I don't know how many people have actually seen this. Uh, just like Gartner looks at services with a company called G2, which looks at products. And on G2 rankings, we've consistently scored ahead of everybody in the world. I know you want to talk about the G2 rankings for a second? Sure. Um. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Focus only on G2. Yep. So G2 uh, is an online rating platform where um, companies, customers can give reviews. And G2 also publishes from time to time um, like a grid around like, you know, the satisfaction and the performance of various products. So if you see, Iris Carbon has been uh, ranking high on customer satisfaction and that has been consistently uh, there. So, as, as an organization, I, I would kind of say we are a very listening organization. We speak to customers very regularly. We get feedback from customers. That's how we are able to keep our products uh, always 
up to date and also we gear up for all future uh, requirements. So this is one of the key reasons how we are able to maintain a consistent uh, ranking in terms of high customer satisfaction on the grid. And uh, of course, comparing to some of the key competitors, if you see on some of the parameters from a product perspective, we are in fact uh, uh, ranking higher than some of the bigger competition which uh, exists in the market. So that is very, very uh, promising and nice to see as well. I would actually request every one of you who wants to know more about this thing to actually visit G2 and look at Iris comparison with other products. It will be a revelation, I promise you. Sure, sure. Sir. And uh, how much was the recurring revenues for the entire year? If you could just give that number. Balu. Recurring revenue for the whole whole of the year, of which 24 would be. Uh, Around 62 to 62.5 crores. 62 crores. Okay. And uh, the same figure for FY23 was what, sir? There have been about 57, roughly. 57. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Shriyansh Ajmera from Retail Investor. Please go ahead. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Please. Yes, you are. Uh, yes, uh, sir. Uh, first of all, congratulations for, for our great set of numbers. I had a couple of questions. So, uh, in terms, uh, this is specific to Iris Carbon. So, how do we place uh, ourselves against uh, bigger companies uh, like, uh, for example, Workai and uh, America and uh, technology in Europe? Uh, like, what specific sort of uh, target market that we are targeting? Like, what kind of company that we are targeting? For example, uh, some of these uh, some of these competitors have been able to onboard like some of these multi billion dollar organizations. So are do are we targeting those or are we targeting like uh, somewhat smaller organizations? How do how does our target market basically differ from theirs basically? Hello. Yeah, yeah. So I'll take that question. Uh, this is Turbo. So I think uh, historically is. Yes. Uh, Berkiva and some of the other competitors, like you mentioned, have been focused mainly on the enterprise market. So over a billion dollars in revenue, kind of uh, client time. Uh, our target historically has been the mid-market and SMB segment. So anything under a billion dollars, where we have had been, we have been targeting. Now, having said that, we do have quite a few customers who are also enterprise customers over. A, in revenue. Uh, so we've never differentiated necessarily on the basis of what the revenue size of our uh, customers or prospects are. Moving forward, I think we will also start focusing. Uh, we were preparing the product for the enterprise customers, uh, especially from a disclosure management point of view. Uh, moving forward, we will continue our focus on the mid and SMB segment but also start entering more and more proactively into the enterprise uh, segment, both in North America as well as Europe. Okay. And uh, basically, what, what is our, uh, basically, uh, USP, if you would, if you would say, are, are more compared to these organizations, for example, I believe they, their enterprise is their selling point, right? They can cover, like, five, six departments, aside from just the CEO, CFO's department, I'm sorry. So... How, but the, what, what, what is our selling point, basically? Uh, let's say we, we are good. But the one is our price, I'm assuming. Uh, I've seen the G2 reviews, mm -hmm. that's why I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. So, you could answer that. No, so I, I think differentiator, so price is one factor, like you rightly called out. But I don't think we are differentiating just alone on the basis of price. I think we have a fantastic product. We need to create more awareness and differentiate based on what value we are adding to our prospects or our customer base. Uh, we need to do a more effective job over there and an ROI based sale, quantifying that value for them. Um, you know, there might have been more features, functionality in some of our competitor products, but that does not mean that is what the client means, but really solving a pain point or problem for them. We are focused on solving the problem end to end for our clients. And I think our service, uh, customers service, um, after sales service has been phenomenal, so that's been a big differentiator. So a lot of word of mouth uh, and reference is what we also focus on. Okay. And this I want to add to this. One second. This I want to add to this. 
Um, I think uh, several uh, more or less said it. I think uh, pricing is one of it, not all of it. I think uh, we have superb uh, customer experience for so the quality of service and the integrated bundle service that we offer. Uh, and of course, the product functionalities and the speed of uh, release, which I think Anil said is listening, I think all of that makes for a, a comprehensive package. So I think, like Sir said, now it's just about uh, making sure that we increase the awareness and get the cadence of getting in front of uh, the right audiences in, in, in the market. So that combination is what is going to make the difference. What would you say our total addressable market is for Iris Carbon? In terms of global, if you could have, if you would have a number for me. So go. Okay. Um, I would say this addressable market for iris carbon is roughly in the range of 10 to 15 billion dollars. Okay. So we are probably scratching the surface right now. Vertiva estimates it to be a little higher, but I think from our point of view, we think it should be somewhere around this range. So, uh, 10 to 15 billion dollars. Basically, we are banking on the fact that we will keep uh, adding more and more functionality to our product because that's how this number will grow so high, right? Not really, not oh. really. See, the point is, the point is that also multi, we take a good carbon, it's used for different kinds of reporting in different parts of the world. And what Servo said earlier, moving away from the mandate. So, whether you add features or not, there is already a core product which can be sold to people. We are able to gain away customers from our competitors at this point in time quite successfully. So revenues will grow. For revenues to grow, you don't necessarily need to add more and more features. Sure, we will keep adding on new features, but the sales does not depend only on adding new features. We already have a viable product that is currently accepted in the market. And uh, this is regarding collect. Uh, so uh, uh, based on our November uh, 23 uh, conference call, we have or expanded a lot in Africa. I can see that from your presentation as well. So, uh, what do? How do you see the current uh, RFP pipeline for collect uh, for the coming year? See RFP pipeline. I can't. I don't know much about because one fine day a regulator wakes up, issues an RFP, and something actually happens. And but what I can say is, increasingly RFPs are being issued. And just because RFPs are being issued doesn't mean we will win them. We don't win every single one of them. Uh, as I said, regulators are waking up to the need to move such platforms, and increasingly it's happening. So, uh, as I said, am I prepared to hazard a guess in terms of uh, how many RFPs will be issued this year? I have no idea. Do I have one to hazard a guess in terms of what the value of those RFPs will be? I don't have any idea at this point in time. What I do know is that more and more regulators are waking up, and even surprisingly, regulators we did not expect are waking up and started talking to people and saying, can I start looking at this? And uh, so some, uh, there are no numbers I can offer you if that's what you're looking for. Uh, okay. Uh, so follow up to this, what is our win rate uh, in terms of RFP and uh, which market uh, specifically we are focusing on for collect? So if you take a look at the win rate again, that's going to be a number that's difficult to come up with. I'll tell you why. Before COVID, we were winning 55% of the bids that we were putting out. After COVID, it's only now that things are picking up. We still have a very small number to go by. So if you have two people in the room and one person leaves, it will look like 50% of the people have actually left. Uh, which, as you know, that we had that there, it's very hazardous to apply percentages when the number of, of number of VCs is very, very small. And that's where we are. Maybe in about a year or two years time. So when I gave numbers about 55% will pre COVID, that was over a 10 year period. But therefore, and right now, post COVID, there are very few, uh, that have actually happened. Therefore, it's difficult to come up with a number of percentage of wins. As I said, five years from now, I'll give a percentage of wins. It will be a meaningful number. Today, the percentage does not make any sense uh, for anybody at this point in time. And which markets are we tracking? There are 70 countries in the world that have adopted XBRL for electronic filing, whatever. And which means there are 120 countries that have not done that. Every one of those countries is a potential market. I did not expect, for example, that Bhutan would be an adopter as they are at this point in time. It's quite, and, and it's surprising the kind of some countries are actually getting into it. I see some traction in Africa. I see some traction in Asia as well. So uh, this is why you see us spending more and more time in Africa. Uh, but nothing, nothing significant to report at this point in time. Uh, for example, we got some Nigerian clients for bank reporting, even though Nigerian Central Bank is still not ready with the finance with the reporting with the reporting platform. 
So each country is moving at its own pace, but we're reasonably confident that of the 52 countries in Africa, 54 countries in Africa, we expect something to happen going forward now that South Africa and Mauritius have examples to show. So uh, Africa is certainly an area where we, are, where we are concentrating. Also, you may have seen that the CAG of India, the Comptroller of the General, has issued a, issued a report about two years ago talking about data standards and how governments in India, state governments and government departments should follow data standards. We see that as a possible, uh, as possibly creating opportunities for us going forward. We don't know where the opportunities will come. We are trying, we're knocking on doors, we're talking to people and, and basically sensitizing them to the CAG report as well. Uh, so where will that, uh, the growth come from? I'm not being difficult, I just don't know. You know, I know which doors I'm knocking on, but if I keep start talking about which doors I'm knocking on, the next step is why they not do it, what, what, who won, who did not win. These are, it's a concept that needs to be sold. Structured reporting uh, is, a, is a completely new concept. And we are fighting against PDF-based reporting and document-based, paper-based reporting. So we are optimistic, we are confident, but the focus, as I said, is on underserved areas like Africa and many other regulators within a country like India. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, another question for just a small follow-up question to this is uh, from Collect. We receive primarily the project-based revenue. Do we envisage this revenue to convert into uh, annual recurring revenue in the future? It's not only project-based revenue. There's also product-based revenue. There's also a licensing revenue because iFile is sold along with the Collect platform. Are we trying to move it to an annuity-based model? Yes, we are. But are people willing to do that? The answer is no so far, uh, except for Mauritius. So the Mauritius model gives us hope that regulators across the world will start looking at it. So we are optimistic it will happen, but I think it's a fantastic question. We are trying to move it to an annuity-based model going forward. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, just a small question, that's all I have. Uh, so we had uh, a little, a few months back, we had uh, gotten the approval for uh, raising our equity capital. So do we have any plans to raise funds in the coming year? So if I'm very happy to send you a proposal for 25 crores. If you want to give it to me, I'm very happy to take it from you. Uh, as a company, we certainly, while we have 15 crores in the bank, we certainly want to add to the war chest to be able to mount a meaningful, uh, meaningful assault on the markets that we want to get into. Uh, we did not raise money earlier because of the way, you know, people, people, I don't, I don't think many people still today have an understanding of our business like you do. I mean, the people on the call have a good understanding of our business, but the majority of people still don't. And I think until such time as that happens, raising capital is difficult. We raised the, we raised the, uh, the, uh, the office capital also because we at that time were also looking at ESOP. We also did it because we wanted to be prepared in case Suddenly, some offer came to us from investors, inquiry came to us from investors who wanted to put in money. We are, we are not saying we are actively in the market looking for money, but I'm also not saying that we are not actively in the market looking for money. We need resources to grow to the next level. We, with the 16 crores in the bank, I think the equation changes. We have enough to kickstart our activities. Is it enough? I don't think so. How much more do we need? Do you have some idea? So the answer is yes and no. Complicated answer. You will think I'm being difficult. I'm not being difficult. I'm just being truthful. Thank you. Uh, sir, are we looking at debt uh, instead of equity? or is No, this, uh, absolutely no. No, no, no. Absolutely no. We will not look at debt. We, we're not interested in debt. There have been people who come to us with the office of debt. We will not look at debt. Thanks a lot, sir. That's all from my side. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Matesh Mehta from Investor. Please go ahead. Thank you once again. I have a few questions. One is uh, a promoter stake is uh, reducing. That is just a uh, factor of uh, ESOPs or is from our promoters actively uh, reducing their stake? If you, I think I urge you to take a look at the filings. You will not find promoters actively reduce the reducing their uh, they're holding. You can look at, please look at the filings. Please look at the filings. You will have the answer. Okay. My second question is like, uh, we have some 16 odd crores, uh, cash balance and we have some six, uh, five to six crores, uh, short term borrowing. So is there any specific reasons why, uh, borrowings are, uh, kept or, uh, uh, like, uh, companies, uh, increasing watches for some inorganic, uh, opportunities? 
uh, there is no inorganic opportunity of any kind that we are considering at this point in time. So under the provisions of the bank limit that we have from ICICI, we are required to utilize something, otherwise we end up paying a hefty commitment fee. So some utilization actually happens on the lines that we have from ICICI Bank. Okay. And my last question is uh, pertaining to client mining. Like, uh, do we have an active team uh, because we have a list of market clients? So, uh, are we have a specific team working on client mining? I think everybody in sales is looking to cross sell. So, we have a number of MCA customers who are also GST customers, a number of GST customers also who are also MCA customers. And logically, when we have a new offering, we first go to our existing customers. So, is there a separate team for it? No, there's no separate team for it. But cross-selling is an extremely important thing. And even in the context of Europe, as Sargo will tell you, Sargo, you want to take this question and add to how we are trying to get deep into clients, especially with the non-mandate like stuff? Okay. Okay, that's it from my side. Thank you. Okay. Sargo, you had a question. Sargo, could you answer the question? No. No, I think uh, it's... Is good, but if you want, I can elaborate a little. Please elaborate. Please elaborate. Yeah, please, please, please. Sure. So I think the idea is to get into. Uh, so we have an existing customer base across the board um, to whom we can not just upsell, which basically means more pro, uh, more of the same product, but we can also cross sell. So we've got multiple products across the board that we can uh, sell to them. What we can also do is. There are these are large corporates which are globally present and have multiple subsidiary or child organizations. If you want to think of it that way, the objective there is to bring in not just the product but multiple products across the board. Um, so that's one of the strategies we're looking at uh, to make footprint within our existing customer base. Okay, so that's another question. Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, can I request, like, if uh, management thinks like uh, we develop a special team for client mining because the kind of market clients the uh, company has, like uh, we see a lot of potential in uh, uh, like increasing uh, per client billing. So when you say client mining, I'm not sure if I understood that. Right? Can you elaborate? Uh, what do you mean by uh, client? Uh, uh, cross selling, uh, cross selling. Uh, uh, Products as well as servicing services. No, absolutely. Sure, I, think um, it's good, I think it's a good solution. We will certainly see what will be done. Thank you. I think it's a great solution. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ketan Artavli from Robo Capital. Please go ahead. Hello, sir. Thank you for the opportunity and congratulations on a great set of numbers. I wanted to know if our Q4 margin of 21% is sustainable on an annual basis. Well, you want to take that? Okay, traditionally, you know, you would have seen that our Q4 margin is a little more than the you know, uh, other quarter margins. Having said that, I think it depends on the overall volume growth. If the volume growth is, uh, you know, robust. I don't see any reason uh, why the margins uh, should, should be less than our annual margins. Quarterly margins you should not see so much, but there are certain quarters where, you know, uh, there is uh, higher volumes happening in certain parts, parts of the business. But overall, the you know, margins are uh, very closely linked to uh, the, vol the overall uh, volumes uh, or overall growth in the top. Okay, well, so basically you are saying I that... Know, I, I just want to mention that uh, one is the EBITDA margin. Uh, at the PBT level, uh, you know, um, uh, we, we do have some overheads, but overheads are growing at a much lower rate compared to the overall revenues. So that also is something which is, looks quite promising. So the PBT level, you would see that the PBT doubled while EBITDA went up by 45%. So that leverage still exists for some more time. Okay, got it. And... Uh, on the employee cost, how much uh, increase do we expect generally year on year? How much do we expect? Yeah, yeah. In, I mean, uh, due to increments or hiring, how much increase do we expect year on year? Okay. So it is uh, hard to put a number because the different businesses are different uh, you know, requirements. For example, in, um, in the SaaS business, we definitely want to increase our sales and marketing presence and you know, uh, 
make sure that we are we are covered our markets well in terms of both inside sales and some feet on the street. Uh, having said that, we have grown our expenses, employee expenses about you know 28 to 30 percent over the last couple of years, uh, which I think is a fairly you know um, fairly you know high number, high high percentage. Okay, so uh, you know. Um, uh, in a you know uh, business as usual case, uh, I don't see uh, uh, the growth in employee cost going up uh, above these levels. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. As there are no further questions, I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. S. Swaminathan for closing comments. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for participating. I'm sorry, we went 11 minutes over time. Uh, I hope all your questions are answered. Thank you all for your support. And uh, I just want you to know that uh, our pride in the company is driven by the financial performance of the company and not the stock performance of the company. However, we are mindful of returns to shareholders and therefore we are mindful of our obligation to do the best that we can to ensure that our financial performance gets improves uh, going forward, improves quarter on quarter. But it's not a company that you should look at quarter on quarter. Take all this look at in the context of the year because quarter and quarter is really very misleading numbers, literally. So I am grateful to you for participating in this, in this conference call and keep your suggestions coming. Several people uh, sent me a question a little while, some time ago, asking why we are not paying dividend. We are not paying dividend because we need to raise capital, we need to conserve resources. We need to conserve resources and dividend paying is not the most optimal way to reward everything. I think the day we have enough cash, we end up doing a buyback as opposed to paying dividend. We don't have enough cash right now to, to do things like that. That's the approach we're actually going to take. So if you are looking at a company that pays you dividend quarter on quarter, we are not the company for you. This is not, oh, you're on, you're not, you're not the company for you because that's not the approach we're actually going to take. And as far as we are concerned, the money that we have right now needs to be conserved for accelerating our growth for of our carbon products and other products as well. Uh, so I want you to understand that. Keep your questions coming. We may not answer certain questions from time to time for some reason. You could be in a silence period where some people keep reminding us of the questions, uh, but to be aware of the silence period when we really won't take any questions. And we answer it at the at meeting settings. So once again, thank you. I want to thank all my colleagues. We do have a, so my colleagues in response to, in, so we've completed 20 years of business this year. So we're actually going to be celebrating with all of our colleagues this Saturday when we're going to talk about, uh, when we're going to talk about growth going forward and etc. We're also calling our auditors, our, 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 uh, internal auditors, our suppliers, our vendors, all of our partners who have taken the company this far. But all of this can happen only with the support of shareholders. So to each one of you, I'm deeply grateful. Bali is deeply grateful. We are deeply grateful. Thomas is very grateful. So please, thank you. Keep it coming. And we will continue to do the best we can to ensure that you are doing all this. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank you, members of the management. On behalf of Iris Business Services Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us. You may now disconnect your lines. Thank you.